So thank you all for joining us today, and let's get started. For those of you who are unfamiliar with his work, Dr. Cullis is a professor at the University of British Columbia here in Vancouver. He completed his PhD in physics at UBC and then pursued postdoctoral training in biochemistry at the University of Oxford as an MRC postdoctoral fellow, and at the University of Utrecht as a fellow of the European Molecular Bio Biology Organization. He joined the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at UBC in 1978 and was appointed professor in 1985. Dr. Cullis is an internationally recognized pioneer and leader in the field of lipids, biological membranes, and liposomal drug delivery systems. His drug delivery systems have produced improved formulations of several cancer therapies as well as other drug agents. His lipid nanoparticle delivery system is a leading technology worldwide, enabling the therapeutic potential of siRNA. He has published over 300 scientific articles. He has been very active in the development of several biotechnology companies and is recognized as a remarkable researcher and innovator. Dr. Cullis co-founded the Canadian liposome company Inex Pharmaceutical, now Tecmira Pharmaceuticals, Northern Lipids, Lip Lipex Biomembranes, and most recently Acutus Pharmaceuticals, Precision Nanosystems, and Mesentech Incorporated. In addition, he co-founded and was scientific director of the Center for Drug Research and Development. Dr. Cullis has received many awards, including leadership award including Leadership Award of the Canadian Society of Pharmaceutical Scientists in 2010 and the Prix Gallien Candace Premier Prize for Achievements in Pharmaceutical R&D in 2011. Most recently, he was also awarded the Milton Wong Award for Leadership by Life Sciences BC in April 2015. Peter's newest accomplishment is the publication of, of, the, of his book, The Personalized Medicine Revolution. Thank you, Dr. Cullis, for making time in your busy schedule for the webinar, and I'm quite excited to be here and participate in this presentation. The floor is all yours. Okay, thanks very much, Grace. Um, you know, with that introduction, I guess we don't want to give much more of the seminar. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, the uh, I should say that you know that does sound like a lot of things, but uh, I've had uh, a great deal of assistance and help and. Uh, uh, from a very wide variety of people and so it's really been much more of a group endeavor than it is any one person. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the uh, application of microfluidic mixing uh, certainly as it's practiced uh, by precision nanosystems for uh, generating uh, limit size <coughs> lipid nanoparticles. I'll try and indicate why that's important um, at least from the limit size point of view and I'll try to also indicate why uh, these things, these these types of systems, this type of process, uh, has uh, has really quite revolutionary consequences in terms of new uh, new therapeutics, particularly as they apply to um, to genetic drugs such as uh, <coughs> siRNA, mRNA, plasmids for gene editing, gene therapy, etc. So what I'm going to go through today uh, is uh, as indicated on the present slide. Uh, just a bit of background with regard to limit size of nanoparticles. This is going to betray my age because I'll go back to some of the original original procedures for making uh, these systems. The applications to microfluidics uh, for generation of these uh, of these limit size systems. Applications for systems that contain um, hydrophobic cores, uh, triglyceride cores, and then uh, for uh, siRNA as an example of the approach or the um, the possibilities for uh, for for genetic drug use. Okay, so why why first of all are we concerned about size uh, in a um, in a nanomedicine? And it's uh, really because, as indicated in, in the present slide. Uh, the size is a very is, is really a determinant, an extremely important determinant of the potency of whatever delivery system you're trying to um, you're trying to uh, construct. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the magic number is around about uh, just a bit more than say 100 nanometers, uh, but in that region cells can take up uh, materials by well-established processes such as endocytosis. Extravasation is a possibility uh, in the area of cancers and other uh, fenestrated for example, there's holes that are in the range of 100 nanometers, and so you can get material out of the circulation. Uh, the lymphatics, if you want to get material that uh, will drain through the lymphatics, we have to get down to maybe in the region of 40 to 50 nanometers. 
Low-density lipoprotein, as we're all aware, can get pretty much everywhere in the body. It's about 20 nanometers. Of course, we don't, don't want to get too much smaller than 10 nanometers because things then just get filtered out straight through the kidneys. So but that gives you a, a little bit of an idea of the um, of the size range that we're, we're quite interested in. Maybe it's 20 to 100 nanometers as being uh, an, operative, uh, <clears throat> an operative or a, a range to be thinking of. Now, just to give you an example, Logical potency. Uh, this is an, this is a study that was done by Cabral et al. in uh, 2011, and it just shows that so for these uh, these are <coughs> these are polymeric micelles, but since it's generally a uh, general observation for uh, for nanomedicines uh, <coughs> as they're used to deliver um, cancer drugs, the, the smaller systems here you can see on the left hand uh, on, on slide D. Uh, the penetration or the accumulation into the um, into the tumor is dramatically enhanced for the, the 30 nanometer systems uh, that are indicated up uh, indicated up here, uh, as uh, compared to say 100 nanometer systems uh, that are in the black or green. Um, green is uh, 70 nanometers, and the corresponding uh, potencies you can see on the the, the, <coughs> the these these systems are um, are. Taking uh, <coughs> taking with them some DAC, some plat a uh, platinum drug, a cancer drug, and you can see that the efficacy of the smaller systems is uh, really really uh, rather markedly uh, exceeds the uh, the uh, potency or the uh, the uh, cancer uh, the cancer um, therapeutic abilities of the larger systems. So this is just one example. There's many others, uh, but this points out the need if you want to get to where uh, these uh, nano these nanoparticles. Um, need to go in order to have a, uh, the strongest biological effects. You need a bit of control size, and particularly having systems that are small uh, is important. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so we need to use uh, delivery systems that are as small as possible to maximize tissue penetration. That's one consequence or uh, <clears throat> one uh, one takeaway that we can uh, that we can uh, operate on. Um, I just should define what limit size is here, and. Uh, it's really the smallest size is compatible uh, with the packing structures uh, or the packing properties of the molecular components in an energetically stable structure. So that uh, the, these systems, if you if you uh, want to satisfy pharmaceutical demands, of course, they have to be able to be stable for uh, periods on the order of a year at four degrees, and preferably two years. And so they have to be energetically stable. Uh, and not, for example, aggregate and grow into larger structures, which if they're in a metastable state, they definitely will. Uh, so the um, so that's the just a word on limit size. Previous methods for making these systems uh, they go way back. Uh, 1969 sonication uh, for making 20 nanometer uh, vesicles, uh, dilution for organic solvent dissol dissolving the lipid in organic solvent. Uh, the battery and cord method, as it's, uh, it's referred to, um, is, a, is, a, is a technique that's, uh, that's actually related to what we do, uh, but it goes, again goes way back in the literature. Uh, detergent dialysis, uh, which was used to reconstitute elements of the respiratory uh, chain um, by Racker and his associates, again uh, producing systems in the range. But these are these are limit size systems; they're as small as you can get. Um, Sonication is not a nice technique uh, for those of you that ever used it, and the other techniques are even worse. I'll just uh, <laughs> leave it at that. Those, those of you, that, the Bastrian corn method actually isn't that bad, but it's highly irreproducible. The detergent dialysis process is very difficult because you have to get rid of the residu residual detergent, and that's a difficult thing to do. Um, so just to point out that uh, if you look at these things on a scale, um, you, you might 80 nanometers, 20 nanometers. What's the difference? Uh, the, um, the one's a bit smaller than the other. But when you draw the picture, uh, say Doxil, uh, this is a currently a, um, a lead, one of the lead uh, <coughs> nanoparticulate systems that use, is used in the it contains Doxrooms and it's used as camp for cancer chemotherapy, uh, breast cancer, uh, brain cancer, etc. Uh, the um, 80 nan the, the, it's an 80 nanometer system. You can see that the limit size system of 20 nanometers is really appreciably smaller, and uh, so it's that that sort of this, these are the kind of uh, the kind of advances that we uh, would like to take advantage of. The, the penetration properties, obviously, of the smaller system will be substantially enhanced. Okay, just to give you a, a bit of a background, particularly with regard to the um, 
the uh, battery and corn dilution from ethanol approach. Uh, this is uh, literally a technique that we were using in, in more or less uh, this form uh, right up until uh, the advent of the micro mixer, uh, the uh, <coughs> microfluidic mixer. Uh, so injecting lipid dissolved in ethanol into an aqueous buffer uh, that uh, is being stirred by a stir bar. You can see this is rather crude. You can produce these lipid nanoparticles uh, with a 25 nanometer diameter. But you do problems, large dilution, uh, obviously the uh, <coughs> diluting the lipid into the uh, into the aqueous media. Um, you need rapid injection. What does that mean? It's very operator dependent. Uh, rapid stirring, again operator dependent. You get a you'll get a, a variable fraction of large vesicles, um, pretty much impossible to scale. Uh, we were using this kind of approach for uh, making SR, lipid, lipid nanoparticles uh, containing sRNA as well. And um, the uh, end the conclusion here is that we need a better needed a better mixing technology. And uh, this is where I got together with Carl Hansen in the physics department here at UBC. And uh, Carl suggested that a better mixing process would be uh, microfluidic mixing. Um, of course, I immediately uh, retorted that, well, doesn't that mean we just get microliters? And um, he, uh, he laughed and said, that, no, basically, you can, you can scale these things up uh, to, uh, to get reasonable, um, reason, not just reasonable volumes, but to, to, uh, to very large volumes uh, through a variety of means, one of which, of course, is parallelization of the devices. So, the, so microfluidic mixers <coughs> operate in the, um, their dimensions, I mean <coughs> that you have uh, laminar flow. And the, uh, the, the particular approach that we use is a sta staggered herringbone mixer, um, this which provides uh, rapid, as is indicated here, rapid, well-defined uh, mixing technology. Uh, the, uh, in essence, what those little veins do, as you can see on the, uh, you can see on the left-hand side here, well, I guess my little pointer is not really all that apparent, uh, over here, uh, they cause the uh, two, the two uh, you're here, you're, you're injecting lipid and ethanol in one arm, that's the brown arm, and then the, um, the uh, aqueous, uh, aqueous media in the white arm. Uh, the two, the two uh, solutions fold over each other as a result of those, those uh, staggered herringbone structures and cause very rapid diffusion between those, uh, folded, um, those folded layers. And you, thus, you get really quite rapid mixing, submicroliter volumes in milliseconds. Now, just to give you an example of how how fast and how rapid this is, this is mixing of a fluorescein solution. So, so two aqueous solutions, but uh, fluorescein. One's at pH nine, and the other's at pH five. Now, cal fluorescein doesn't uh, fluoresce at um, at pH five, and so you can see there's one dark channel coming in, and then there's one green one, which is the pH nine one. And you can see on the, on the, as you go through really the first, the first of the microfluidic mixers, as uh, blown up on the left-hand side here, uh, that the um, that the uh, <clears throat> the pH five material is clearly coming up to pH nine. I'm just looking at the wrong thing here. There we are. And so you can start to see the green, uh, the green fluorescence appearing really as it goes over the first uh, veins of the um, of the of the uh, of the mixing um, of the micro mixer system. And so, by the time it's gone through a couple of times, as is indicated in the, uh, the green, uh, totally green um, <clears throat> uh, structure below, uh, they're well mixed. So the fluid has a residence uh, time of approximately three milliseconds for complete mixing, uh, with a two milliliter, uh, two mL per minute flow rate. And so we do get uh, this is slide here is indicating for various uh, flow rates uh, the. Um, the uh, mixing of these of the fluorescein solution, and the bottom line is indicated at the bottom that uh, flow rates of two milliliters per minute will give rise to uh, mixing times of three milliseconds, mixing a volume of 14 uh, <coughs> of, of uh, 14 nanoliters. So you get extremely homogeneous mixing as a result of this approach. Now something's gone wrong with my um, this uh, this diagram here. Uh, the um, this is supposed to be a, uh, <clears throat> a really a, another rendition of the uh, structure you see on the left here. Uh, this uh, this mixing approach, and for some reason in, uh, we've encountered a technical difficulty here. Uh, <clears throat> but the uh, point being that if you dissolve, you can form bilayer vesicles now by b dissolving bilayer components such as 
uh, palmitol aureol phosphatidylcholine, POPC, together with cholesterol in the ethanol stream, uh, and the aqueous buffer, uh, having, of course, water, uh, push this through and use the nanoassembler for this uh, to mix these uh, two streams, dialyze the what way the ethanol, and you end up with the sized systems. So the um, this is just showing that the flow rates ratios. This is the flow rate of the aqueous uh, of the aqueous stream versus the lipid in the ethanol stream greater than three. Uh, you end up with these limit size systems, POPC topping out at around about or a minimum diameter of these vesicles of about 20 nanometers, and with it, if we have cholesterol there, they're at about 40 nanometers. So these are these are beautiful systems. They're um, uh, easily better than what you would get uh, from a sonication approach or from the battery and corn approach, uh, uh, but they're all, but they're uh, done in a, in a, in a, with a low energy input, so there's no degradation and uh, is an eminently scalable, uh, eminently scalable operation. So just to show a little bit on the um, the uh, how we might characterize these systems, uh, the um, and this is just indicated by in this this. Uh, you want to look at these little vesicles on the left-hand side. You can't see the arrow, but you can see I'm moving it in that direction. You can see for the very small systems uh, that the um, that the uh, surface area on the outside is way bigger than the surface area on the inside. And so we can do phosphorus NMR. This is a phosphorus NMR um, uh, spectra for the POPC system. If we add a, a, a manganese to essentially quench the signal from the outer monolayer, we're just left with the signal from the inner monolayer, and by the ratio of those two signals, uh, we, can de we can determine uh, what the uh, outside-inside ratio, as it uh, might be termed, and from that we can calculate what an effective diameter is, and it comes out to about 25 nanometers. Uh, if you have cholesterol there, they come in a little bigger, and uh, so there the effective diameter is, um, <clears throat> when we add the manganese, we, we, we reduce the signal slightly, uh, slightly less. Anyway, the effective diameter is about 45 nanometers. And so all these measures really correspond very well to each other. Uh, this is just uh, indicating the, um, <clears throat> the cryo-TEM cryo electron microscopy. And you can see there's a good correspondence. In the case of the crowd tem it's indicating structures that may be a little bit smaller, 20 nanometers for the POPC systems and, uh, and 44 nanometers uh, for the, um, the POPC cholesterol. So, of course, we don't, don't just want to make these things. We want to put some drug inside them. And uh, so one question might be, with this high cur curvature of these systems, can we actually load them up uh, with, a, uh, with a bit of drug? And the, um, we use a, uh, a pH gradient approach that sim simply involves uh, making the interior slightly acid. Here we're trapping ammonium sulfate. The ammonium uh, ammonia comes out, leaving your proton behind, and so it gets more acidic. And then the drug that's the weak base is accumulated in the neutral form, protonated, and then it can't get back out again. And if we have a three unit pH gradient, for example, we can get a thousand times higher concentration of the drug on the inside. Uh, than it would be on the outside. So it's a very efficient way of loading these systems with drug. So we can do some theory here and say the, uh, <clears throat> the look at the loading uh, process. Uh, we can see we can load up to a 0.2 uh, doxorubicin to PLPC ratio, and then it falls off a bit. But then we can do a calculation and say, okay, if what is the maximum amount if we've used up all the protons that are available through the ammonium sulfate? And you can see it agrees pretty well with theory. So these things. Uh, so these, these very small systems can be loaded uh, with drug, and the drug can be retained. So this is just showing cryo-TEM, and you can see the, the, the uh, doxorubicin uh, crystallizing on the inside of these uh, very small vesicles. Uh, this, is, uh, <clears throat> this is analogous to the situation you would see for the 80 nanometer systems I showed you previously. I showed you previously for doxel, where similar sorts of structures are observed, but of course they're much larger. Um, so the, um, the, uh, the, I guess the point here is that these long, long circulating um, uh, lipid nanoparticles that are very small, uh, such as this, could be the basis of a new generation of lipid nanoparticle therapeutics and will certainly be expected to uh, exhibit improved properties as, uh, as compared to the second generation systems uh, that are much larger. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> the um, 
the, uh, the the next thing is to have a look at well, what other ways can we use uh, the microfluidic mixing to make uh, novel systems? And one of them is for making uh, limit size triglyceride systems. So for again, this uh, uh, for one reason or another, this particular slide isn't transmitting particularly well. Uh, the um, but the point here again is now we're using a li different lipids. We're using Instead of the bilayer lipids we were using before, we're using only one bilayer lipid, and we're using triolein or a fat as the uh, as the other component. Uh, the, the, these systems have historically been pretty much impossible to make, and we're dissolving that in ethanol. This is these are analogous to uh, lipoproteins, um, <coughs> LDL and HDL, etc., that are in the blood, and that um, have a hydrophobic core surrounded by a monolayer of lipid. And so, again, at a flow rate ratio of about uh, three, so this is an aqueous um, flow rate to the ethanol flow rate of about three to one, uh, you can see that we're getting down to, uh, to very small systems in the range of 15 or so nanometers um, from, these, from a mixture that has POPC and triolein in, in a ratio of 60 uh, to 40. Uh, if we uh, if we look at these systems by cryo TEM or cryo electron microscopy, uh, you can see that uh, if you compare them to our vesicles that we had before the PLPC, the bilayer vesicles, you can see that these systems are different. Uh, they seem to have kind of a more electron dense core, uh, which we we uh, term a solid core, and it corresponds to being like little fat fat globules uh, surrounded by a monolayer of lipid. And so just to prove that, we went back to our phosphorus NMR approach and uh, added manganese. Now, if, they were just, if it was just all, if all the phosphatidylcholine was on the outside, uh, then you'd expect when you add manganese, you'd totally eliminate the signal. And that's exactly what happens for the PC uh, triolein, um, triolein systems as compared to, say, the POPC cholesterol systems. So it's a, uh, we now have a nice way of making uh, these, uh, these systems with a hydrophobic core uh, that uh, that's certainly has uh, not been available um, before in the literature. So uh, the uh, one point here is that uh, we should be able to modulate the size of these systems simply by changing the ratio of the surface lipid uh, to the core lipid. So the limit size should be um, dependent on the PC uh, class PC triolein ratio, and uh, of course I wouldn't be putting this slide in if it wasn't the case. Um, the uh, so if we if we put in if we vary the PCPOPC triolein ratio, uh, and then uh, and then um, calculate from the uh, the area per molecule of the lipid and the and the volume uh, of the uh, of the of the phosphatidylcholine and the volume taken up by the hydrophobic material on the inside. Uh, and we can we can uh, theoretically redirect that using the red line what the diameter should be, and you can see it correlates pretty well uh, with the um, with the actual di diameter measured by light scattering. Okay, so we can generate these uh, these types of systems, solid core systems, for the first time uh, that have a triglyceride core that's surrounded by a monolayer of phosphatidylcholine. Um, the um, <coughs> Just want to the, the last part. Just want to talk a little bit about generation generation of these of limit size systems for uh, sRNA, small interfering RNA. Although I should say that these same observations will extend uh, in large part uh, to uh, other formulations of other um, of other uh, genetic drugs such as mRNA or plasmids. Uh, so the two two techniques are currently used: uh, preformed vesicles, where you mix vesicles. Uh, that contain cationic lipid, actually a positively charged lipid with a negatively charged sRNA in the presence of ethanol, and then a T-tube process that uh, mixes using a, um, a T-tube mixer. And so these are the two uh, processes just indicated in, uh, in cartoon form. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> the trapping efficiency of the preformed vesicle approach uh, where you already where you have the lipids, uh, it, or they're already formed present in an ethanol solution, is is not great. Um, they can, it's, the, we, the, <coughs> the lipid nanoparticle diameter is uh, is is on the order of 80 nanometers or larger. It's rather difficult to scale. The T2 process is uh, uses very high fl uh, flow rates. Minimum working volume is is quite large. 
uh, it's really difficult to adjust mixing conditions and you get larger size ranges and very often inhomogeneity in these size distributions. So the, the point being that both methods use bulk mixing. These are variations in local concentrations of components and inhomogeneity that can result from that. Uh, here's my uh, slide that seems to come back with the difficulties each time, uh, but the um, the uh, <coughs> the message is pretty clear. What we're doing here is mixing lipids dissolved in ethanol, which now include cationic lipids that I mentioned, in order to trap a negatively charged polymer. Uh, the um, the you, you need a uh, positively charged uh, component in your in your carrier system to entrap. And uh, injecting the lipid in, in ethanol, the sRNA in the aqueous media um, at uh, pH 4, could be, uh, simply because the cationic lipid is an ionizable cationic lipid, it's only uh, positively charged at low pH below about 6.4. And the, um, <clears throat> so then it can combine with the uh, sRNA. Uh, but when you bring the whole si to, uh, to get the encapsulation, but when you bring the whole system back up to neutral pH, uh, the, um, this, the particle itself is relatively neutral, which is important from a, a utility point of view. So uh, <clears throat> using, again, a flow rate ratio of three, that's three parts eth water to one part ethanol contains the lipid, we can, contain, we can achieve a lipid nanoparticle um, size of about 60 nanometers uh, for a, um, an sRNA to lipid ratio 0 0.06 on a weight to weight basis. I think this corresponds to a few hundred, maybe a hundred or so oligos per particle, per 60 nanometer particle. Although I can't, don't quote me on that, it's, uh, but it's something in that range. Um, so we get 100% encapsulation efficiency for the, um, for the, uh, the sRNA in these nanoparticles. And uh, obviously uh, the uh, size is pretty good. The, uh, the encapsulated sRNA is fully protected from the external environment. If you use an RNAs, uh, the um, encapsulated material is not chewed up unless we have, unless we have triton, the detergent, uh, present. And so these are robust systems that uh, do contain the sRNA in, a, um, in an encapsulated form. So if you look at the, at the structures here, uh, the, the sRNA systems in the middle um, are, uh, <clears throat> are quite clearly solid core as opposed to, um, as opposed to the, uh, if you look on the far left, you can see that the vesicular systems uh, look quite different. Uh, in a sense, the, solid, the, the sRNA systems are much more similar to the uh, POPC triolean systems uh, as indicated on the right. Uh, we, we then uh, said, okay, well, that, what, what really is the structure? We went and, and uh, worked with uh, Peter Thieleman at the University of Calgary, who is a simulation or is able to do these large-scale simulations of uh, what one might expect if, in the lowest energy configuration for these uh, structures. And what he came up with, after using half the computing power in Western Canada, as he uh, indicated, uh, was a, um, a structure uh, that is, is a raisin pudding uh, sort of structure that's uh, quite consistent with the um, with the oligonucleotide uh, being sequestered on the inside in uh, the aqueous pockets inside the uh, the uh, kind of overall solid core uh, structure of these uh, lipid nanoparticle systems. Um, just a word or two on the mechanism of formation. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, this is, uh, if you, you can see the lipids, we have a peg lipid, we have, they have cholesterol, that's the uh, diamond, uh, the kind of purple shape, uh, well, I guess more orangey purple. Um, the green is the cationic lipid, uh, the white one is the phosphatidylcholine, and in the water we have the oligonucleotide, and that's at the low pH, as I mentioned, pH 4. Uh, <clears throat> the the uh, nano assembler, the microbic mixer, allows us to raise uh, the uh, polarity of the medium from ethanol to uh, very largely water or three quarters water uh, over a period of a microsecond or a millisecond. And uh, so this, the first things that will fall out of solution will be the most hydrophobic particles that you, um, that you, uh, that you form. And so that will be uh, the, um, the, the nucleotide combined, combining by charge interactions with the cationic lipid and uh, forming the hydrophobic, um, very hydrophobic structure that's indicated in the here. And uh, I can't quite find the arrow, but anyway, it's the structure in the middle uh, <clears throat> that um, 
well, by itself would aggregate with other particles, other similar particles. But if we do this fast enough, uh, we can trap it in these. Um, if we do the mixing fast enough, we can trap that structure uh, in the um, in this uh, limit size configuration uh, by coating it with this layer of uh, the peg lipid, which um, is the uh, has the white squiggly um, uh, head group that you can see in the uh, in the structure on the far right. And so we, we use this very rapid mixing to trap these uh, systems in this lowest or limit size uh, configuration. So by, at, by changing, and you can just see quite simply, if we it's in the same way that we change the size of the uh, PC triolian systems by adding, uh, by changing the ratio of PC triolian, we can change the size of these systems by changing the amount of the polyethylene lipid, the ratio of that uh, to the rest of the lipids. So this is just show, showing here that uh, as we increase the, the peg lipid component from 1 to 5 percent, uh, we move from a size range of about 50 nanometers to something in the range of 25 nanometers. Uh, <clears throat> if we look at the uh, cryo-TEM of these systems, uh, again, it reflects the different sizes that we can achieve on the basis of, uh, of just, just by this very, what, this very simple variation in the amount of peg lipid that we're putting in there. Um, we can model this theoretically and uh, just so show that we can predict the size of the uh, of the lipid nanoparticle systems just on the basis of the uh, ratio of the peg lipid to the other component lipids. Okay, so the uh, microvic mixing approach uh, really allow re really allows us to satisfy all the basic criteria we need for in vivo use of these lipid nanoparticle systems. A near neutral external surface, that's by virtue of the uh, ionizable cationic lipid, relatively non-toxic uh, size ranges that are, um, are, uh, <coughs> are right in the range that we want them to be, and we can dial which size we want. Um, high encapsulation efficiencies uh, that are in the range of 100%, monodisperse. Uh, if we want to really want to load these things up, we can. A couple of, for an 80 nanometer system, we can, we, if we really push it, we can get to 2,000 oligos per lipid nanoparticle. It's scalable and reproducible. Just finish uh, to show, uh, to say that these systems are highly potent. Uh, the, um, the, if we inject lipid nanoparticles containing SI uh, to knock down factor 7, factor 7 of course is made in hepatocytes in the liver, um, but it's a secreted protein that can assay for say 24 hours later uh, to determine the levels in the blood. So it's a nice assay for determining uh, the, um, the knockdown or the gene silencing potential of these systems. And uh, this just points out that the systems that we're using here I'm not going to go through this slide in any detail, but it certainly produces nanoparticulate systems uh, of uh, containing sRNA uh, that are highly potent. At the time this was published, uh, this was the most potent system that was available uh, worldwide. There are slight improvements on this now, but that's just a matter of, of the more of the cationic lipid that's improved, uh, not the uh, formulation technique. Okay, so uh, the, uh, for sRNA, we can generate and load uh, sRNA or lipid nanoparticle systems in the 20 to 80 nanometer size range, high encapsulation efficiencies, um, the monodispersity, reproducibility, scalability issues are um, relatively straightforward to address. Uh, rational design of the size uh, <clears throat> by varying uh, the proportions of component lipids with excellent in vivo activity. Uh, so that's really all I was wanting to say. I hope, I hope that uh, you've got a, a, a picture of the utility of uh, microfluidic mixing for generating uh, the really what are the uh, the most active lipid nanoparticle LNP or drug delivery systems in general uh, for practicing um, gene therapy, whether it's uh, silencing particular genes using sRNA or expressing genes using uh, mRNA or practicing such, uh, such uh, processes as, um, as uh, CRISPR-Cas9 for gene editing, uh, um, <coughs> gene editing uh, studies. The, uh, so the future is, is really pretty bright in, the, um, in this area. We can silence any, at the moment, we can silence any gene in hepatocytes with, uh, with excellent uh, therapeutic indices. It's giving rise to therapies for quite a number of disorders. Uh, we can expect systems quite soon that will be able to transfect other tissues, immune cells, 
uh, bone marrow, um, endothelial, epithelial. Uh, the list is, is, is going to go on and on. Right now we have systems that do work in these, in these tissues. We just haven't quite got the potency there yet uh, to really push these forward into the clinic. And the other exciting thing that's happening, of course, is that um, we, aren't really, we aren't really confined to using these systems for just silencing genes for sRNA. Uh, they're also um, applicable to much larger molecules, uh, much larger uh, DNA or RNA uh, polymers, such as messenger RNA or plasmids. And uh, so protein replacement therapies, vaccines, as well as some of the gene editing approaches are certainly becoming on the table. Um, so it's a really exciting time in this area, and the, uh, the micro-mixing approach is certainly very, a, a part of that, uh, a, par a part of making um, gene therapy a, uh, a reality. So with that, I'll close and uh, I'll take any questions. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for that, Dr. Cullis. Um, we'll begin with a few questions here that came across us. Uh, so there was a slide that showed your first generation, your second and third generation of lipid nanoparticles. What do you think the fourth generation will look like? So we saw a reduction in size there with the addition of PEG, but um, what do you think the next, what is it for you anyway? Um, well, the, 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 uh, one of the interesting things with these particles is they're, they're taken up into cells uh, by um, we operate, the systems we, we have are usually taken up by endocytosis. And uh, the endocytotic, getting out of the endosome into the cytoplasm for a macromolecule such as sRNA is not a trivial uh, process. I mean, we're, the, the, the systems we have are obviously more efficient than, anybody, than anybody's had previously, uh, but they're still only about 2 to 4 percent efficient. And so the, um, the, some of the big, uh, I think the big advantages, the big advances are going to be made by making that breaking out of the endosome and accessing the cytoplasm a, more, a much more efficient process. Sounds good. Um, so one more question we'll have. You mentioned, you know, you focused on the liver near the end of your talk there, and then you listed a huge uh, long list of tissues that you think will be the next one. What's the one you're betting on? What's the next one for you? Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, one is that these systems, as they currently are, uh, work very well uh, in the uh, in the brain, and uh, the um, the um, <clears throat> of course you, they, they don't get into the brain by accident. You have to inject them directly, either into fecally or into uh, the um, or into the intraventricular spaces, whatever. Uh, so the, uh, and there we're just taking advantage of the same process. Actually, we take advantage of in the liver. And that is that these systems are um, are they seem they, they attract they absorb apolipoprotein E, uh, which triggers uptake uh, into the um, into the hepatocytes via the LDL by the scavenging receptors, and uh, a similar the apo E is the, the major lipoprotein in the brain, and the um, and so there's a very nutritional microglia and, and uh, accumulated by neurons anyway. So it allows us a very direct entree into neurons. And so that's, that's certainly a pretty interesting. It, it, I don't know if we're going to be able to get past the uh, blood-brain barrier, but uh, there are, for, 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 for serious disorders, uh, there certainly are approaches that would just say, okay, let's, let's go in in a more direct manner. Thank you so much um, for answering our questions there as well, as well as a great talk we were able to hear today. Uh, I'll thank everyone else as well for joining us today. If we didn't get to your questions, we will answer them via email after the event. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about Precision Nanosystems, please visit uh, www.precisionnanosystems.com uh, to view a list of Dr. Cullis' publications as they pertain to drug par uh, particle, nanoparticle drug formulation please visit the resources section of our website or feel free to re reach us at info at precision-nano.com. Thank you once again and have a wonderful uh, day. Cheers. <laughs>